Hi, this is Mickey Keating. I am the writer and director of the movie Off Season, and you are listening to The Graveyard Show. And welcome to another edition of the Graveyard Show podcast. I am your caretaker and the graveyard is open. Well, welcome back, everybody. It's good to have you back here inside my graveyard. It's been a while since my last show. And I know, yes, that is my fault because, well, it is my show. But, um, well, I have a good reason. And that is because uh, the month of February, I spent basically working on the newest edition of my video program that I release online called Catacombs of Horror. Well, I was able to actually finish it and upload the latest episode, which you can find online. And I'll get into more about what it is and why it took me so long on the other side of this interview. Because as you heard at the top of the show, I'm going to be talking about the new movie Off Season. And uh, in a moment, I'm going to be joined by the writer and director of the film, Mickey Keating. We will discuss uh, Off Season, uh, which you can uh, find in theaters, on digital, and on VOD starting March 11th. And on the other side of this interview, I'm going to have information regarding the new 1980s science fiction documentary called In Search of Tomorrow. It is uh, produced by our friends at Creator VC. Uh, Of course, Robin Block, the executive producer and creator of the series, David Weiner, the writer and director of the series, as well as, uh, well, Samuel Way, who's the editor of the series. Uh, I'm going to have information on how you can pre-order the film. It's a limited window. I will get you details. So a lot to talk about on the other side of my interview with Mickey Keating. I'm not going to waste any time because as you hear in the background, my grave digging team is hard at work digging a new grave for this graveyard. And when that happens, it means my guest is here and it's time for me to get back to work. And joining me now is Mickey Keating, the writer and director of the new film Off Season, which will be available in theaters and on digital and VOD starting March 11th. Uh, Mickey, thanks for joining me here on the Graveyard Show podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Well, it's great having you here. Um, I saw your film. Well done. For those that are listening right now, why don't you tell everybody uh, what your film is about? Um, Well, Off Season is the scariest movie you'll see this month. Uh, It's about a lonesome island town where a character goes to visit to tend to her mother's destroyed grave, and she finds that there are very frightening things afoot. And, uh, and yeah, it's a fun time and um, very excited for everyone to see it. Yeah, there's a, there's a caretaker who's uh, causing some problems there. Now, I just wanted, for the record, it was not me who was the caretaker that was ruining everybody's lives <laughs> there in this movie. Um. Hey, it could be, though. You know, it's like, let's get the fan theories going. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> well, yeah, you know what? You have a point there. Maybe it was me, after all. <laughs> um, so how did you come up with the idea for the film? Um, You know, I really wanted to do something that was about family secrets and, you know, kind of a love letter to Southern Gothic stories, you know, and I wanted the vibe to almost feel like an old creepy book that you would find in an antique shop, sort of. Um, And just the general feeling of being an outsider in, you know, someplace that's supposed to be familiar and welcoming. Um, So those were kind of all the jumping off points. Plus, I wanted to make a movie in a beach town in Florida because I feel like that's a uh, very underutilized image image in horror films yeah i agree um it was funny because when i was watching the film i was kind of trying to figure out where it was shot and i thought well maybe it was um in maybe new orleans or somewhere in louisiana and then i was like well maybe it's in like the carolinas uh but it turns out it was in florida so uh how did you come up with the idea to uh film the movie in florida Uh, So I grew up in Florida, and um, the thing that I really always thought was very kind of unsettling was during the off-season, we would go to the beach when we would skip school or whatever, uh, drive out there, and desolate beaches are very strange, and when you see just the figures of few people in the distance, it's a very unsettling kind of feeling. Uh, So I knew from the beginning, from my very early years as a filmmaker, that I was one day going to go back there and shoot something like that. And off season was the one. 
You know, it's interesting because um, having grown up in New Jersey and going down to um, the shore during the off season, I, I agree. It's kind of creepy. It's just mm-hmm. kind of like it's like this deserted, you know, <laughs> beach town. And you're kind of like, huh, this kind of seems just right. like, you know, like, does anybody really live here? And sure enough, I mean, there are. But yeah, it is kind of creepy. So um, shooting this film during the pandemic. Um, how hard was that making this film during the pandemic? Well, we were actually very lucky. We wrapped this movie three weeks before the world shut down. So wow. literally, we, I, I think if we were, if this film is not the last pre COVID movie, it is one of the top three last uh, pre COVID movies. So, you know, we, we have this conversation a lot. I mean, uh, my fellow producers where if we had pushed for you know two weeks we would have had an incomplete film so we're very 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 lucky that we got out in time wow talk wow talk about fortunate that's fantastic because yeah, I'm looking yeah, at this sure. and I'm like, the, the, this is the, if you were to make a movie during the pandemic, I, I, I'm like, this is like one of those movies to do because, you know, you have this nightmarish world that Marie and George are entering and you have, you know, a lot of isolation. I was like, man, he really pulled this off. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it was thank you. And, and I think what's so funny is maybe I should have kept it in my back pocket because it would have been a, uh, a relatively inexpensive COVID movie, too. <laughs> but uh <laughs> How could we have known, right? Uh, exactly, exactly. So uh, <laughs> what kind of shooting schedule were you uh, looking at with this film? Um, I think we were down there for, for almost a month. It was a quick shoot, and which is very kind of uh, even more grueling when the Florida elements are constantly throwing everything they can at you. One day it was freezing and 30 degrees and 30 mile an hour winds on the on the beach. And then the next day it was 90 degrees and mosquitoes were absolutely everywhere. So uh I, the nice thing was I meticulously planned this film to such a degree that uh, we had every shot planned months in advance. But if I hadn't, I think it, I would have ripped my hair out because <laughs> it was very, very, very stressful. Yeah, I, I can't I can only imagine. I mean, talk about that as a filmmaker, how the importance of like scheduling, because I think that's one of the things that I think some filmmakers just don't get. Like it's it, mm-hmm. like you kind of go, oh, we'll just kind of wing it or we'll go in there and we'll just kind of see how it is. As far as like planning shots, can you talk about why you do that and how important it is f- not only for you, but for other crew members to kind of see what it is that you want to accomplish? Um, for sure. Well, so I think the best thing that I can say is like if you pre-plan your film and you storyboard your film and what we did for this movie was we went a step further and we actually started cutting the storyboards uh to the movie so so before we shot anything we had a whole movie planned out of just storyboards and i think what's the most important thing when you're an independent filmmaker and you're racing against the clock and all of a sudden you know it starts raining and you're not going to get your shots you know okay i can punt this shot to the next day when we're here i can move this shot later and then suddenly it just becomes uh, a, a process of just marking off the shots that you've already gotten and knowing the ones that you need to pick up later. So preparation, I think, is the most important thing when making any film, but particularly when you're doing an indie film where you're racing for every minute of every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a race against the clock the minute you step foot on the set. Right, right. So, so, so you know, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. People don't want to be the the crew wants to know exactly what they're shooting because then they know exactly how they can light and they can make more time be, you know, making the shot beautiful as opposed to being like, well, let's generally light the entire room because we might need this angle and this angle. I think it's absolutely essential. Yeah. You you had that fantastic shot in the um, in the I want to say the bar where everybody's kind of frozen in time. Mm-hmm. How long did that take to put together? Because it looked like it was practical where everybody just kind of held a pose. It was, yes, yes. There was no trickery with uh, computers after the fact. And, you know, that's just one of those moments as a director where you're sitting behind the monitor and you're like, wow, people are really talented <laughs> because I wouldn't have been able to hold still that long. So, yeah, that was all them. That very, was, very talented actors. <laughs> yeah, it really was. It was really fantastic. I was, I was really impressed. Well, you know, I think nowadays we're so spoiled with computer graphics and just seeing all these big blockbuster movies where you go, oh, okay, that was CG, that's CG, that's CG. When I see practical effects now and just things that are done in camera, I go, oh, yeah, that's how films used to be made. And it's really impressive. For sure. For sure. And, you know, it's like 
Uh, I grew up and I didn't really teach myself After Effects or anything like that, which maybe I should have. Um, but I don't kind of go into a, a, a shoot saying, oh, we can clean this up. We can do this because I don't know how to do it. And so I know that I have to pay somebody to do it. So in yeah. that way, any CGI that we did in the film was meticulously planned way in advance because we knew that was where the money was being spent um but maybe i'll teach myself after effects <laughs> well it's not a bad thing to learn but uh, but what's funny is that i'm noticing that with a lot of young filmmakers such as yourself that you guys are starting and gals are starting to use more practical effects which is is kind of interesting because we live in this age where everything's digital and everything is you know computers and yet we're still kind of going back a little bit in time to the way it used to be which is in camera sure. and it's really refreshing because I know for me, having grown up, because I'm really old, um, having grown up uh, seeing movies like Jaws or, you know, like Star Wars or Raiders of the Lost Ark, when you would see movies like that that are practical, it just makes you appreciate everything, not only about the movie, but everything that those technicians did to make you believe that you're in that world. Oh, 100 percent. And, you know, we're at a, at a time right now where technology permits anybody to be able to shoot something, you know, amazing on their phone. And I think what audiences once you've seen the universe explode enough times, you kind of become desensitized to that. And I feel like as an audience member, I want to see the magic trick captured in the moment. Right. Because then I'm like, it doesn't matter what they shot on film, digital an iPhone. Some crazy stuff is happening just being captured by the lens. I think that's a really, really exciting thing and kind of uh, takes away from the conversation of film versus digital or anything like that because you're just seeing something real happening right before your eyes. Yeah. That's why the Jackass movies are so good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, because you know it's actually happening. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I really enjoyed about your film is that I kind of, you could feel it. You, you, you're watching the movie, but you feel like you're there at this, you know, seaside area. And Thank you. Um, your film reminded me a little bit of, of two movies, um, Dead and Buried and mm -hmm. uh, Messiah of Evil. And uh -huh. you can kind of mix in a little bit H.P. Lovecraft as well. And I'm wondering if, if any of, uh, whether Lovecraft or any of those movies uh, were something that influenced you at all. Um, sure. Yeah. Well, I think I think inevitably the Lovecraft um, of it all, for sure. It's like you can't avoid, you can't escape that. Uh, and and Dead and Buried and Messiah of Evil, you know, they're they're kind of two. Those are two movies that I actually I really really enjoy Dead and Buried. Um, and so those are kind of two movies where where you kind of feel like, wow, this is just like this feeling is something that I don't necessarily know if if this is what I love but this is what i you know the a vibe that's always great and agreeable uh to, to me as as a filmmaker and so yeah everyone really picked up on messiah of evil and quite honestly it's like that was one that i saw way you know when i was back in film school mm -hmm. and i liked it fine but it definitely wasn't like the anchor point that i think everyone kind of is familiar with and it's, it's funny because it was on shutter um a after the movie premiered at south by southwest i was like let's check it out again and i was like shit like you know i could totally see all all three, all these movies being like a triple feature. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Intentionally or not. Yeah. They've got the same spirit. <laughs> yeah, really. I mean, you, you could group these three movies together and do a triple feature. And I mean, I think sure. your movie, to me, your movie fits more with Dead and Buried in terms of like look and feel mm -hmm. and just like, cool. you know, you feel cut, you can feel the wind, you know, cutting through your jacket, you know, like, and, and yeah. just kind of just hitting you. And I was really impressed with it. Um, Thank you. I was also really impressed uh, with your cast. So um, you have this cast that has a really great pedigree, especially in horror. You have uh, Jocelyn Donahue, who, of course, was in um, The ha uh, House of the Devil, uh, Dr. Sleep, Insidious 2. Uh, Joe Swanberg from VHS and You're Next. Um, you had Richard Brake in the movie, who, of course, has been in everything, including playing Joe Chill in Batman Begins. Um, <laughs> an actor you've worked with quite a bit, uh, Larry Fessenden. Um, yes. And, uh, of course, for those um, uh, out there as well, he was the star of Jacob's Wife, and it was in Isolation. Uh, and then you have um, Melora Walters, who was in um, Paul Thomas Anderson's films, Magnolia and Boogie Nights, and then she was also in Dead mm -hmm. Poe Society. I mean, talk about a great group of actors to bring together for this movie. Um, how did you find all these actors? 
<laughs> well, so, you know, it's like these are all people that I've dreamed of working with. And, and this was the first movie where, you know, we were really in, in a position where I was able to have our casting director, uh, Lindsay Weissmuller, like reach out to to reps and get and, and get a, a realistic kind of approach. Uh, Melora, I've been a fan of for absolute ever. And um, and so. Uh, she was the only one who I wanted to play this role. She's incredible as a, an actor and as a person. So I was very, very, very lucky uh, to get her on board. And I think, you know, and Joe, uh, uh, Jocelyn, I mean, I can't say enough great things about her. Uh, she is brilliant in all the movies that you mentioned, and she's just a great actor to work with uh and and joe you know and and richard break you know they're just an absolute joy i think they, they, everyone had a really really was so nice and wonderful and there was no ego and they're just really brilliant actors so as a director you know robert altman says it best it's like casting is 90 percent of your job <laughs> so, <laughs> there's so many moments where i just sat behind the monitor and i was like oh my god i'm watching this as a movie fan uh they're they're all i i love them all they're great yeah and and it's great too because i mean jocelyn carried a lot of house of the devil i mean because she's just mm -hmm. kind of hanging out in the house so i'm sure too to know that she can do that brings a lot of uh confidence for you as well as for her Oh, 100 percent. And, you know, it's like as a director, you know, I don't I, I don't really believe in auditioning actors or having actors read for a role, because if I've seen them work, I, you know, or I've seen what movies they've been in. Why would I? I know they're good actors. <laughs> so like literally like the minute that I sat down with Jocelyn, I was like, God, perfect. Like doesn't matter who else I, you know, anybody else, you are the lead character. And she really brought it and she understood it. And I think, you know, there, there's a world where, you know, actors in a movie like this can like overact and be way too big. And she really brought it to like a level of, of real kind of, I was so impressed with how she handled so many of the scenes because with a lesser actor, you know, th those moments could go awry or they could be yeah. way too big. She's just brilliant. Well, yeah. And the scenes with her and Melora, I mean, <laughs> Talk about like you could feel the tension, but it's 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 like you said, it's like they knew how to maneuver and, and make that work without it being over the top or sort of just predictable. Um, yeah. How much work? Thank you. How much rehearsal time did they have or did they meet beforehand? Uh, did any of that happen to or did they just kind of show up on set and they just worked it out and with you and off you went? Um, I don't know if they met, maybe they met once before we shot, but, um, you know, and what's great for me, you know, as a writer, I'm like, well, they don't have to know each other very well. They're very strange. <laughs> so, um, uh, but, but what we did, you know, the minute that I knew that Melora was going to be in the movie and play Jocelyn's mom, I just started writing more scenes and I was just like, let's just see what, what this flashback and, and how wicked, uh, you know, she kind of treats uh jocelyn in the film and so really you know we set up those two those two shots and we just let them kind of go and and it really was I, I i scheduled two days for those for that bedroom scene and we really just found what happened you know and and then a testament to my editor valerie crowfiber i mean she kind of found the rhythm uh of that relationship without making uh uh, Melora, like Apple, absolutely <laughs> terrible. <you know? laughs> your uh, director of photography, uh, Mac Fiskin, you've worked with him on your other films. Um, I'm yeah. sure that really helps, especially when you're going out on location uh, to have that yes. kind of relationship. So, um, talk about the working relationship that the two of you have when you're starting to uh, prep a movie and then when you're on set shooting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, we, we, you know, it's like I, he's my old, one of my oldest collaborators. And so we really challenge each other and push each other. And I think every movie is an effort to make the, the previous one uh, look, well, I say like a postage stamp in comparison. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, what's so great about us is that we're like a, an old married couple at this point. So when a location doesn't quite look right or we haven't found the right place, like Mac will go on Google Maps and find a place nearby and be like, let's go check out this place. And so like we had the hardest time finding a dead end in this in Florida, believe it or not. <laughs> You're kidding. And so we must <laughs> yeah, we must have scouted 50 dead ends until we landed on one that we like. But I think it's an effort to really, you know, we're past the, the phase of being polite and we can now really push each other as as artists. And I think that's really, really, really essential. So what I say to Mac is like, I will always have an answer and a plan for you. And so if you're not happy with it, let's make it something even, even better. And so that's, that's really a, a great relationship to have. 
Wow, that's nice. Um, you used a lot of fog in the movie. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I, I always go back to the movie The Fog and think about the nightmares that they had trying to, you know, lay in the fog and then a gust of wind would come by and take it away. So for, for your film, uh, how tough was it to work with The Fog? It was it was in, it was terrible. But, you know, we had a great uh, technician named Justin Muller, and he was so patient and he had backup after backup and uh, fog machines would short out. They'd stop working. Uh, it, it was because it's all real. Like there's no CGI fog in the movie. And so uh, we would fog up that entire main street and then an ocean breeze would come and then it was gone. Awesome. <laughs> and so, yeah, we, and we had really had a, a hard time figuring out. It's like, do we say action? Do we start rolling and then fog up the whole place? Do we fog it and then start rolling so it was i say never ever ever work with fog uh because <laughs> it's it's unwieldy <laughs> the conversations that are heard on set <laughs> oh you're like you're, you're thinking to yourself you're like why did i do this to myself yeah. what is my, what's wrong with me <laughs> <laughs> i know it's like man it, it seems so great when i was writing it and now i have to do yeah. it it sucks <laughs> <laughs> Aesthetically, it looks immaculate, but in practicality, it's the worst thing ever. I I want to quit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of fog, um, there was uh, a certain music cue that I heard playing in your film a few times that sounded strangely familiar. Oh yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if you did that on purpose. Did you pull that? Did you find out? Is that uh, is the fog one of your favorite movies? And you wanted to pull one of the jazz cues? So let me tell you, I was for sure convinced. I was like, everyone's going to watch this movie and say that I, you know, I was doing my spin on the fog, right? So I was like, this is inescapable, uh, but I'm going to try my very best to, you know, make my own film. Uh, but I know the comparisons are inevitable. But uh, so when we started clearing the music for the movie, um, all of a sudden, my, our, our music supervisor came to us and she's like, hey, I have access and a relationship to this entire catalog of music if you'd like to just check it out and find, see anything that, you know, you uh, would interest you. So I was like, sure, great. And I started looking and all of the Alan Morehouse songs that are actually in the fog uh, that, you know, are playing on the radio station yep. were available for us to use. So I was like, all right, I would be absolutely foolish not to use these songs and make my direct loving reference to John Carpenter. And so that's, that's, it was a very fortunate coincidence and I'm glad it happened because we pulled out the songs that we were using. And we're like, let's just pop it in. Great. <laughs> I love it. I thought it was awesome. I'm sitting there and I'm watching it and I'm like, wait a minute. And then, yeah. and then it went, and then I'm like, well, maybe I'm imagining this. And then I heard it again. I'm like, oh, no, I know this cue. I, yes. <laughs> it's yes. definitely that cue. Room so, no, magic. I think that's brilliant. Thank I, you. It was brilliant. Thank really. You. Thank you. It's also because it's, it's, it's the Easter eggs, you know? I mean, fans of horror are going to be like, that is so fucking cool. For, well, I, I, yeah, I appreciate that. It's a, That's a great classic song. It's in a, I think it's in a Heinz commercial, too. And it's also in the Disney Channel movie, My Date with the President's Daughter. And so <laughs> fans of either Heinz or My Date with the President's Daughter will also get a kick out of that song, song being used. <laughs> <laughs> that is cool. That is so awesome. I love it. I love it. I was, we just needed Stevie Wayne to come on for a moment. And then that, yeah. that would have just made it all complete. <laughs> yes, 100%. <laughs> I resisted that urge to do a knockoff of that you know that's that's inimitable right yeah <laughs> um so um previously you worked as an assistant to jason blum mm -hmm. um so uh talk about the experience um uh working as his assistant and and learning um as a filmmaker yeah, behind yeah. the scenes stuff so um i did my final semester in school uh abroad in los angeles and then i just like i was like i know i'm gonna move to los angeles so i'm just gonna do my last semester abroad and so i cold called blumhouse and this was right after insidious had come out and i just begged them i was like i'll do anything i will get coffee please just let me you know work for you guys because i and so uh, i went for my interview and i typed in the address and we didn't realize oh it's on the paramount lot <laughs> um <laughs> And so I just started interning there and it was an absolute blast. And, and, and it really was like, and then I got hired as a script reader and then I got hired as his, uh, as Jason's second assistant, which my role was really just like, I'd answer the phone and I'd type in who, <laughs> who, uh, you know, call. Um, but no, I mean, it, it was, so I got to kind of see 
them become the empire that they came. And I think the most exciting thing was just like the guy is the most passionate, energetic, you know, nonstop uh, person that I've ever kind of witnessed. And it's like uh, my thought was like, man, like if I'm worried about one movie, Jason Blum is worried about six movies simultaneously and he's still making them all work and they're all successes. So um, I yeah, I left uh, right as they were like really becoming the empire that they're uh that they are now i you know i had sold my first movie and so i was like i'm a director now bye <laughs> but, but <laughs> it was it was such a great experience that he was so nice to me and and it was really such a fun time uh to be there i got to witness the birth of of you know an empire <laughs> pretty cool yeah i mean i'd be like at being at new line or you know a lot of these other companies early early that you know became mainstream for sure, a hundred percent, and 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 just like how you know, I think they always say, right? Like it's like the nicest people are the people that make horror movies, and everyone there was just so nice and sweet. <laughs> <laughs> you would never know the movies that they're really making. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's, know, like, it's like, oh, they make Hallmark movies here. It's like, no, 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 they don't. <laughs> no, they make very, very scary and effective horror movies, but everyone's yeah. just so kind. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it'll all come full circle when you get your directing gig there on one of their films, and you know that's probably going to happen down the road. Uh, that no, would be I, very cool. I don't know. I think they're I think they're too way too big for me now, but, uh, that, but you know, I'm always cheering from <laughs> From the, from the sidelines. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I'm sure I'm sure he's very proud. I, I'm sure he's very very proud to see your success. He'll be like Mickey um, Keating. Who? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the film comes out on March 11th. Um, is there anywhere on social media that um, my listeners can go to to find out more about the film? Yes. So very soon in the next few days, we'll have the list of theaters that it's coming uh, out in on March 11th. It will be on VOD uh, anywhere you can, you know, watch a a movie on VOD. You know, we're still figuring everything out due to COVID. I I understand if people aren't going to go see the the movie in theaters. Um, We shot it for theaters. So if you want to be brave, please check it out. And then later down the line, uh, it will come out to Shutter. And if people want to follow you online, is there uh, social media they can go to? You know, I'm really not that great at social media. I'm, I have an Instagram, but I really don't do much on it. But uh, yeah, my, it's just my name on Instagram, and sometimes I upload stupid Instagram stories. So uh, <laughs> that's that's pretty much the extent of it. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I'm 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 not on social media at all. Neither is the show. So <laughs> I'm right there with you. <laughs> yeah, you know that's cool. I th- I think that's the good thing. <laughs> yeah, I yeah I do. I'm I'm just um I never really got into the social media thing, and I'm not really looking to try now. <laughs> I know my limitations. <laughs> hey, that's that's fine by me. You're you're amongst friends here. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, listen, Mickey. Thank you so much for coming on the Graveyard Show podcast. Uh, it's great meeting you, uh, and it was great having you on here. Best of luck uh, with this film, and uh, would love to have you back on the podcast for your next horror film. Yeah, please let me know. This was a great interview. I'm very, very uh, happy to be on. Thank, Thank you so much. And as I put this interview to rest, I want to again thank Mickey for joining me here on the show. You can catch Off Season in theaters on VOD and on digital starting March 11th. He's a really talented writer-director, and uh, he's got a really good future uh, ahead of him. He's going to be uh, someone I think we're going to be seeing a lot of movies coming from. And it would be really cool if he actually did get hired by Blumhouse to uh, direct a film. You never know, you never know. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, I have some information regarding the new 1980s science fiction documentary, In Search of Tomorrow. It is uh, written and directed by uh, David Weiner, uh, produced and uh, created by Robin Block, edited by Samuel Way, of course, the team that put together the In Search of Darkness films, which you can still catch on Shudder, by the way, if you haven't seen them yet. You should definitely check them out. Now, In Search of Tomorrow is going to be coming out soon, and there is a limited window right now where you can pre-order the film. So if you missed it the first time it was available, well, now you have a second chance to pre-order In Search of Tomorrow. And you can go to 80sscifidoc.com to get more information on how you can purchase uh, your edition of In Search of Tomorrow. That is 80SSCI. FIDOC.com. There will be details there on the different perks that you can purchase uh, to pre order your copy of In Search of Tomorrow. 
I've seen the film. It is fantastic. I've also pre-ordered the movie as well. Um, but I got a screener of uh, In Search of Tomorrow because, well, my guest for the next two podcasts will be the writer and director of that film, David Weiner. We are going to talk about In Search of Tomorrow. Uh, We're going to get into how he made the movie during the pandemic. We're going to get into a lot about the film. We're not going to give away spoilers because we don't want to ruin the movie for you guys, but we are going to talk about the film as well as um, how he and his team put the film together. So um, Graveyard Show Podcasts 41 and 42, which will be coming your way here in the month of March, um, will be my interview with David Weiner. And I'm also going to go through the perks as well that you can purchase. But uh, in the meantime, you can also go to 80sscifidoc.com to get information highly 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 recommend you get this film it is awesome and i'm not i'm not just blowing smoke here folks i'm a big fan of uh all three of their films that they've done uh in search of darkness one two uh this and then of course there's part three of in search of darkness coming out at the end of the year but david weiner will be here um to talk about his film on the next two podcasts so stay tuned for that speaking of david weiner david joined me on my very first uh edition of my video program called Catacombs of Horror, which I mentioned at the top of the show as well. Catacombs of Horror is a little different type of show. This is an interview podcast. On Catacombs of Horror, uh, it allows me to uh, just talk about horror in general. I can pick a topic and um, just kind of go off and talk about it. Um, Much different than here, which is uh, this show is very interview driven. So David Weiner actually joined me on the very first edition of Catacombs of Horror. He and I talked about what we thought best represented 1980s horror in four different categories. So you can find that online and uh, see whether or not you agree or disagree with what we selected. Uh, The second edition of Catacombs of Horror, I decided to change it up and kind of make it a little more personal. And um, I decided to do that one on my favorite scenes from the 1970 vampire movie, Count Yorga Vampire. It's a film that I've always carried with me as one of my favorite uh, horror movies. I think it's a very underrated film. And um, I think it sometimes gets lost out there in uh, the horror genre. So I thought I would just put this video together and talk about my favorite scenes and why they were my favorite scenes. And I never expected it to blow up the way it did. Um, Many of you out there found it and you're watching it and you're commenting on it. And uh, I really appreciate that because it just goes to show that uh, the hard work that I put into that paid off and um, I'm getting some really great reactions and sort of a conversation um, online about this film. So for this third edition of Catacombs of Horror, uh, again, I try to make it something a little more personal for myself. And um, I started off the month of February by um, recording my audio and starting to find video that was going to accompany this piece. And uh, I have to be honest, I recorded my voiceover and I played it back and it was just dreadful. It was embarrassing and there was no way I was going to put that online. Um, it was it was just terrible. I don't know what I was thinking. So I went back and I started uh, recording another voiceover for it, something that made a little more sense, um, something that was a little more cohesive. And um, I couldn't edit anything um, video wise until I actually had the audio. So I went through, did this, started to find um, the video that I needed to make this. And I'm not a video editor. I'm learning as I go along. And I want to make it enjoyable for all of you out there. When you watch this, you can actually, you know, look at it and say, hey, you know what? Not a bad job. So I'm learning as I go. And um, I finally got everything together. And um, I, I, it's, it's, it turned into uh, this much larger production. And um, it's basically double the length of my previous two Catacombs of Horror. It's a little over 40 minutes, and the third edition of Catacombs of Horror is my favorite scenes and a missed opportunity with the movie Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers. Uh, It's one of my favorite Halloween movies, and um, I go through why that is. I also talk about why I think uh, Michael may not be stalking Jamie, that maybe he's trying to either protect her or claim her for himself so he can pass the evil along. Um, I also discuss why I think Halloween 4, outside the original, may be the most important movie in the series. Now, I don't discuss or include the Rob Zombie uh, Halloween movies or uh, the latest sequels in this discussion. This is bookended from 
the original Halloween through Resurrection. Um, but I got to be honest, I think Halloween 4, even if you include the last four Halloween movies that were made, I still think Halloween 4 uh, is the second most important uh, movie in the series. Important. Doesn't mean the best. Important. So you can find Catacombs of Horror on the Graveyard Show podcast YouTube channel. Catacombs of Horror playlist is right there. And um, I would love to get your reaction on the show's YouTube channel. And of course, you can also email me if you'd like as well. That is gyspodcast at gmail.com. That is caretakerisawesome at gmail.com. So while February was a quiet month, uh, I'm making up for that here in the month of March. You're getting a new episode of Catacombs of Horror that's 40 plus minutes. You have this current podcast, which just uh, went up. Uh, And then you're going to have two more podcasts uh, in the month of March as well with uh, my interview with David Weiner. And then there's another piece that I'm working on as well for the show's YouTube channel as well. Also, um, I wanted to ask if you are a subscriber to the Graveyard Show podcast, thank you very much. If you could rate the show, I would really appreciate it. And you also may want to consider, if you haven't subscribed to uh, the YouTube channel, you may want to do that because I'm starting to kind of do a little bit more uh, for the Graveyard Show podcast YouTube channel. And uh, if you want to know what's going up as soon as it hits, um, I suggest you subscribe so you can get all that new material as it's being uploaded. I have some plans for some other stuff, and uh, sometimes I upload stuff in between podcasts. So just to let you know, you may want to subscribe to the Graveyard Show podcast on YouTube as well. And of course, the Graveyard Show podcast is uh, everywhere podcasts exist, and of course, the YouTube channel as well. And if you know anybody else that is a fan of horror, please invite them to join me here inside the graveyard. New listeners and friends are always welcome. Okay, my friends, I will see you back here very, very soon with my two-part interview with writer-director of In Search of Tomorrow, David Weiner. And don't forget to pre-order In Search of Tomorrow. Go to 80s Sci-Fi Doc com to learn more about how you can pre-order that great, great 1980s science fiction documentary. Okay, that's going to do it for me. And as you exit the graveyard, I would like to remind you to please lock the gate behind you. We wouldn't want anyone to get out. Until next time.